wonderful to be here. And I'm going to be talking about a topic that um, really impacts a lot of people at different stages of their lives. And it's one that's uniformly interesting to, I think, every everyone I teach. Uh, the question of what does Judaism have to say about sexuality? Where is there an intersection between something that is on the face of it an extremely physical experience, an experience that requires uh, the pleasure of bodies, nakedness, and so on? How does that sync with the religious experience or the spiritual experience? And I also, so, so we're going to do a little bit of a, um, a kind of meta reflection on Judaism's attitude towards sexuality, because I'm not a speaker who's going to come to tell you that Judaism is only sex positive. Judaism actually has a complicated relationship with sexuality. It's very, very present and prevalent in our lives. And at the same time, it's very, very distracting and sometimes gets us into not a small amount of trouble. In, in addition, I want to talk a little, I hope you know, part of the, the talk is really about significant changes in the sexual relationship. Because if we go back to the biblical text and the biblical world, we go back to the rabbinic text, the rabbinic world, not only are we talking about heterosexuality, right? Only really men and women engaging in sexual relationships. Not that there wasn't same sex uh, attraction, same sex relationships, right? The, the, the Talmud is aware of lesbian relationships or lesbian sex and, and uh, men having sex, but society didn't really acknowledge or allow or tolerate it in the way that it does today. So all of the texts we're gonna be looking at are very heteronormative. I teach in spaces in which I have LGBTQ students what does Judaism have to say to them, given the heteronormative nature of the texts about sexuality? Furthermore, people get married later, meaning until the 1940s, 50s, until the sexual revolution in the 60s. Sex outside of marriage was happening. It's been happening for thousands of years, but it certainly was done far more discreetly and there was an expectation, particularly of good women, right? Women from good homes, right? Good middle to upper class homes. Um, there's an expectation of virginity and an expectation that you're going to wait until marriage and that really the sexual experience is going to be taking you from your father's home to your husband's home. And of course, all of that really begins to change when the sexual revolution uh, is unfolded in the 1960s with the advent of oral contraception that gave women far more control over their sexuality or over their inability to get pregnant, right? A very big piece. So that today, whether you're from an orthodox and more traditional background or from a non-observant background, um, there are challenges in dating well into your 20s and 30s uh, in, in, before marriage. In other words, for the religious perspective, right, orthodoxy, conservative, reform, they all have a similar thread in that the preference is for marital sexuality because religion preferences sexuality within a framework of, um, of commitment, of fidelity. And so what do we do today when we have so many young and not so young people engaging in non-marital sexuality? Does Judaism have anything to say about that? So I call this how to create a Jewish sexual ethic. I'll just, even today, anecdotally, I sat with a young woman, 19 years old, right? And, and she comes from an observant home. And she's having questions about whether she can remain non-sexual given where her life is right now and so on. And we talked a little bit about should she make non-halachic choices choices to begin experimenting sexually. I very much urge all of my students, all of the people I teach to use Jewish values when making those decisions. Because if I go back to the Jewish halachic texts, all they really talk about is marital heterosexual relationships. That's the only place where we talk about sanctity. But for those who are outside of that frame, I 
strongly protest the idea that you have to descend into anarchy or promiscuity or any sort of non-valued sexuality. And so throughout the course, I'm gonna be talking about the tensions and yet the opportunities that Jewish texts offer in thinking and rethinking how to be more intentional about our sexuality, both within a committed framework and sometimes for those who are not in that framework, how they can make choices that perhaps reflect a value system that I think can teach us all something. Okay, so I'm now going to share my screen. Hold on one minute, we practiced this, here we go. What I wanna look at first, right, is really the creation of human beings starts with Vayivra Elohim et Adam b'tzalmo b'tzalem Elohim bara oto zachar unikeva bara ota. We're in Genesis 1, where it says that God created Adam. Now I know the translators like to say man, but really I find it very important if I don't have to gender a text, not to gender it. So God created Adam in God's image. Adam is male and female. Right? in the way that God doesn't have a clear gender, even though God is always referred to in the masculine. I wish we would change that. But um, that, that Adam, the first Adam, is created male and female in some sort of authentic reflection of the Tselem Elohim, of the divine image. And in Genesis 2, God splits Adam into male and female. So the first Adam is both male and female, one unit, perhaps I'll come back another time to do a whole deep dive into how to reconcile Genesis 1 and 2 and rabbinic interpretation, a lot to say there. But for our purposes, we're interested in the sexual relationship that will emerge after the separation. And what happens here is God says, Lo tov hayot adam levado. It is not good for Adam to be alone right? Because Adam as male and female only has one self to engage with. By separating Isha from Ish, by separating the female from the male, there are now two beings that can interact with one another. And of course, in the last verse, verse 24, what results is Adam, right? I'll, it's Ish, it's not Adam anymore. Ish, the man, will leave mother and father in order to cleave to Isha, the female, and become one flesh. And um, I'll just point out one, I think, beautiful idea that in the Hebrew, it says vidavak biishto, to cleave to his wife, to cleave to his woman, right? To cleave to the woman. And largely in biblical text, or almost unanimously in biblical text, the root of cleaving, which is davak, dvekut, which is some sort of very close, intimate connection, reflects God's relationship with the children of Israel, either because there's closeness or because God is angry at us and God distances from the dvekut, right? But what a beautiful verb to describe the sexual act, right? That in that moment, of cleaving, of the bodies cleaving into one. We have a word that reflects the intimacy of God with God's people. And so I wanna tease out from there what really becomes a striving towards sex positivity, the understanding that when we reunite male and female, at the moment, I'm not gonna talk about same sex, but I, I, I would use similar ideas there as well. When two people are no longer alone and have found one another and cleave to one another in such a physically intense and intimate way, there is dvekut, which reflects the relation, which can reflect the relationship of God with us as well. And so I think that from there we're going to continue because rabbinic interpretation is aware of the incredible potential for intimacy in the sexual act as a reflection of the intimacy between God and humans. And they're aware of the incredible toxicity, the incredible danger really, 
that misuse of that act can lead to. Okay, let us continue. We're gonna look at a few sources. I call this section, religious dissonance. Can sex and religion coexist? And I'm going to bring you, I think it's three rabbinic texts that really show the tension when we look at humans as sexual and humans as spiritual. Rabbi Nachman said in Rabbi Samuel's name, behold, it was good that when God sees that God has created Adam, vihine tov ma'od, and behold, it was very good. Okay, that's the, that's the phrase. Rabbi Nachman says, if I take out the word and, which is really extraneous, I have behold, it was good, referring to good desire, the yetzer hatov, the potential of the human to be very good. The word and is extraneous. And in rabbinic interpretation, when I have an extraneous letter or an extraneous word, I have room to open up windows in the text to deeper engagement. And that's, that's midrash, right? The idea of drash, of like, delving in and looking in between the spaces and cracks of the words for openings for further interpretation. And so we're seeing a beautiful example here. The word and, right, is an extra word. I could have said, behold, it was very good. And behold, it was very good becomes the, 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 the piece, becomes the word on which I'm going to engage in a discussion about sexuality. And what am I going to call it? The evil desire, the yetzer hara, right? Remember, yetzer hatov, behold, it was very good. And humans can be very good. They have yetzer tov. And already suggests maybe a contrast. And now they create this idea that humans also have yetzer hara. And in the rabbinic world, Yetzer hara refers to sexual desire. So just notice, right? In the moment of Adam's creation, which is very good, Adam is created as sexual, which is called the Yetzer hara, which is called the evil desire. But God intentionally creates us with this desire. And so I see that this tension, it's not very good, and yet it is very good, right? And we're gonna call it ra, but we're about to see what power it has. Can then the evil desire be very good? God calls the creation of Adam, who has both Yetzer Tov, Yetzer Ra, good and evil within, very good. That would be extraordinary. How can that be? But without the Yetzer Hara, no man would build a house, take a wife, and beget children. And what I hear here, is something that I actually hear even when I go to lectures by sex therapists. Sexuality or the current of desire that I, I hold within me requires me to go out of my house and meet other people because a sexual relationship requires more than one person in the relationship. It is true that I alone can have some sexual pleasure, right? Self-pleasure. But for it to have any sort of heightened experience, I need another person. So I'm motivated. And the Midrash says that motivation leads men to build a home and then offer that home to a woman who will agree to the economic stability that he's offering. And only after that do I begin the process of sexual relations and having children. And so the idea, right, that in order to be worthy, or experience a sexual relationship in order to be entitled to sexual expression, I have to be productive, right? And really that was the model until the modern era that a man would have to court a woman. He would have to woo a woman. Of course, there were always prostitutes. I'm not, romant over, I'm not so romantic and naive that I didn't know men could find outlets while they were saving money and building the home should they decide to go in that direction. But lawful, right? My lawfully wedded wife, lawful sexuality, sanctioned sexuality by all of the religions, by society, 
can only take place in the framework of marriage. But to get married, a man has to offer a woman a reason to marry. And women want economic stability. So notice what they, what they notice is that the sexual desire is the motivation to go out and build a life not stay in your bedroom eating mom and dad's food because you have an incentive. You want an outlet for your sexuality and that's going to motivate you. And to me, again, that's very, very interesting. Of course, it's going to bump up against from the 1960s onward, the idea of having sex without the need to provide or to prove or to work for it, so to speak. And, you know, we probably won't have time, maybe a part two. Was that good for people? Was that good for women, right? The taking away of this kind of framework as the outlet for lawful sexuality. But the purpose of this lecture, we're seeing the tension. On one end, we need sexuality. God intentionally creates us as sexual so that we'll be productive in life. So it will lead to building a home, marrying, and having a child. Okay, we're gonna quickly look at two more sources because I think you already hopefully understand where I'm going. In Yoma 69b, it says, since it is a time of God's favor, let us pray regarding desire for sexual sin. In other words, you know what? Let's get rid of the Yetzer, the Yetzer Avera, the Yetzer Hara, the desire to sin. Let's just become asexual. They prayed, and sexual desire, which is in the masculine, was committed into their hands. Sexual desire says to them, be careful, for if you kill that one, meaning me, the world will end. So they imprison it, they imprison sexual desire. It's very um, uh, mythological. Think about the you know, pantheon of the gods and, and Greek mythology. Desire is like a virtue, and it takes on a quality of like, a, a virtue. They imprisoned him for three days and then they looked for a fresh egg in all of the land of Israel and they did not find one. It's very sweet because there's a realization that sexuality is not just necessary for our survival. It's necessary for the, the birds and the bees, right? And even the flowers. So they discover there are no eggs because no one's laying eggs if there's no sexual desire. However, you know, there we understand that. And they said, what shall we do if we kill him? The world will end. If we pray for half, they don't answer halfway prayers. Blind him and let him go. At least a man does not become aroused by his female relatives. To which I say, that's a very naive comment. And anyone in the field of social work or psychology knows incest or unfortunately, uh, you know, uh, relationships between uh, um, illicit relationships exist. They did not stop in uh, 300 CE, but okay, at least they have the fantasy that we'll get rid of that. The next source I want to look at is, um, is really one of my favorites. And I think every rabbi, anyone in a religious field, rabbi, pastor, you know, leader, rabbinic leader, lay person um, should learn this source. So they talk about, again, uh, the northern one, I will remove from among you a quote from the prophet Joel. This is the evil desire which is hidden and present in the heart of man. Again, we're constantly calling the Yetzar Hara, Yetzar Hara, the evil desire. For it has performed mightily. Set a baye among the Torah scholars more than anyone. As in the story of a baye who heard, now, first of all, that's quite an admission that Torah scholars struggle with sexual desire because we like to think of our religious leaders of having conquered their desire or not having very much desire. And look at other religions where the priests are celibate, right? Like if you're with God, you don't really need that, right? And Abaye says, among the Torah scholars, meaning himself more than any. As in the story of Abaye, who heard a certain man saying to a woman, let us get up early and go together on the way. He, Abaye said, I will go and separate them from doing that which is forbidden. And really what's lovely about this story is there's a man and a woman about to go on a trip. I read it as the woman says to the man, can you chaperone me? Because it's a little scary to travel alone. Like it's better for us to go together. Maybe the man wants to female companionship, talk about his tsaris, right? About his mother. Women are good listeners. Anyway, they're going on a trip together and Abaye is sure this is going to become sexual. 
And so a bias says, you know what? I'm going to sneak behind them. I'm not even going to tell them I'm here because I'm like, I'm ready for this. I'm going to jump out the minute they fall into each other's arms. It's kind of funny. And it's a, a, a little humor. And for readers, it's a funny image of the rabbi stealthily crouching behind this man and woman going on a trip, having casual conversation, because Abaye is sure they will not get through the trip without becoming sexual. He went behind them for three parasangs in a meadow. When they separated from each other, he heard them saying, our way is long and our company is sweet. Nothing happened. And they're in a meadow. A meadow is a great place to have to frolic, right? Because all the tall grasses. And he is sure they are going to frolic. And nothing happens. And Abaya said, if that had been me, I would not have been able to control myself. He went and swung on the door hinge and a certain old man representing wisdom, right? Came by and taught him. Everyone who is greater than his fellow, his desire is greater also. And the reason I think this is an amazing source is because it gives Torah scholars, religious leaders permission to acknowledge that they have sexual feelings, right? One of the biggest issues sometimes is when someone, well, I can't be sexual, I'm not feeling anything, and then you're doing things that you can't be doing because you're not having those feelings. By saying Torah scholars as well, if a Torah scholar finds himself or herself having feelings for someone they shouldn't, they now have legitimacy to go find a certain old man, meaning a mentor, someone they trust, and acknowledge it and then begin to process it, right? We know that in psychology, that's what you do. When sexual feelings enter the treatment room, a therapist can go to their supervisor or to another therapist and say, help me here, right? Because that can happen during therapy, uh, right, right? Transference, right? The idea that the patient sometimes brings sexual feelings. We don't allow religious leaders to allow a process that, in my opinion, would be a much more healthy way to handle those feelings then stuffing them down, repressing them and pretending they're not there. So I find this source to be magnificent. Two ways, not all men and women are sexual, right? Men and women can go on a journey and nothing can happen. Number two, Abaye's uh, willingness, his honesty to say, I struggle. I could not go on a journey with a woman hopefully not just any woman, but with a woman and not have it end up becoming sexual. I need to be able to talk about this. When we talk about things, we open up those dark spaces and we let light in. And then the Yetzer Hara can become Yetzer Hato because instead of having an illicit outlet, we can acknowledge and make room for feelings we don't want to act on, right? And so I think this source could really be a wonderful source for that discussion. Okay, I'm going to skip the next source uh, for lack of time. I want to bring uh, another source to right now. I'm now I'm moving into a slightly different um, area of the source sheet where I talk about holiness, sex, sex and holiness. So what I've done until now is talked about tension that religion, our religion. Is it a Yetzer Hara? Is there any goodness? But ultimately, Judaism says we are not a celibate religion. We cannot even strive towards celibacy. If someone like Abaye is saying, as a great Torah scholar, I have sexual feelings, then that is not our direction. We need to harness it. We need to channel it. We need to talk about it. We need marriage, right? We need dveikut. We need to cleave, right? We need to, to turn it into something that reflects the image of God. But we can't ignore it. It has positive benefit in our lives it can lead to productivity, to, 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 to growth, and we need to harness it, okay? So now I wanna look at two sources that show that potential. Kahana once went and hid under Rav's bed. This is a very well-known source. I think Gila Fine teaches this source, but I teach it differently. He heard Rav, and, and in Hebrew, it's sach v'sachak v'asatzrachav. He hides under Rav's bed, which already is like a great opening for a story, a little uncomfortable opening, but a great opening. And he hears Rob in bed with his wife. And what he hears is not wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, back to the Torah hall, study hall. What he hears is laughter and conversation. And only then 
Rav doing what he needs to do to tend to his sexual needs. And Kahana is blown away by this because he didn't know that it's not just a physical outlet and act that is a release, but there's intimacy, there's laughter and conversation. It's such an amazing picture, a visual of what it looks like when two people who are connected, who know each other, know each other maybe for a long time and have been having sex for a long time and they get into bed and there's a rhythm and there's a relationship and they're laughing and talking before he gets to his needs. Now, female sexual pleasure is not in here. It's not the point of the story. I hope we'll get a little bit to that. But um, what does he say? One would think that Abba's mouth had never sipped the dish before. There's a very crude correlation in some Talmudic sources between eating and sex. In fact, I once had a student say to me the phrase junk sex, because he's like, sometimes you have sex kind of like eating junk food and afterwards you feel sick. And he was tired of it. He wanted something else. We started talking about more meaningful encounters, right? So food and sex have long been compared to one another. Talmud as well. But Kahana, in a moment of like indiscretion, blurts out, one would think Abba's like, this isn't the first time. Like, why are you so excited? Why is this taking so long? Like, um, I'm counting the minutes under here. I want to get out, right? Enough already. And it's taking forever. Like, what are they laughing? What are all the joking going on, right? He had no idea that sex was about relationship. He thought it was about perhaps saving the man from wasting seed, right? Having a, an outlet that is lawful. But what is this sach v'sachach? What's the conversation and joking? Ruff then says, Kahana, are you there? Get out. Because it's rude. Yes, it is. But it's also funny. He then says what I think is the point of the whole story. It's a matter of Torah. And I have to learn it. And he, he, he turns around to Rav and says, I had no idea. No one tells you this in, in, in the base medrash, in the academy. You're told to go and get married and have sex, but no one says you should joke with your wife, talk to your wife. That's Torah right there. I need to learn that. If you don't tell me how to elevate this into something more than going to the bathroom, more than eating, Think of all that I'm missing out on. And people need to be told. One of the things as a sex educator, and I teach couples before they get married, and sometimes I teach them even after they've had sex, you know, sexual relationships, we talk. People actually need to be taught how to have good sex, how to have meaningful sex, right? But when I say good sex, right, even differences between male and female sexual response cycle, right? Right. We, we, oh, you'll figure it out. You love each other. You're attracted. Go figure it out. I have a cousin. I'll give her a shout out, Jody Waxpress. She's a religious sex therapist. She treats couples who are religious and not. She lives in Israel. She says to me, Nahama, I have couples coming 20 years after marriage who are still not enjoying sex. It's so sad, right? Here we are and we've promised them, wait till marriage or this is where it's really going to be good. But if we don't talk about these things, how to have good sex, that a lot of times people do not figure it out on their own. And Kahana turns to his rub and says, you need to teach this. This has to be more than go get married and have sex. I did not know. And now when I go home to my wife, think of what a difference it's gonna make. This is Torah. If you tell me Torah is the book by which, or the, it's not just a set of rules, it's a way of life by which I live, this is part of it, okay. I'm going to get to the next source. I can't not teach this source. This source also is a fantastic source. This source is about female sexuality. There are not a lot of source stories like this where the woman is the heroine in the story. As I often say to my students, rabbinic texts are androcentric. They're male-centered. They're told by men, about men, and even when they're about women, they're through men's voices, right? Women's voices aren't being expressed, at least not in a overt way until much later in our history. And, um, and so today as a woman learning those texts, I get to add my voice. Um, but this story is about a woman. Okay. There was once a man who was very careful about the commandment of tzitzit, the fringes that you wear under your clothes. He heard there was a prostitute in, town by, in a town by the sea 
who took 400 gold coins as her price. That's an astronomical amount of money, meaning enough to support a woman for two, three years. Like she is the best of the best. He sent her 400 gold coins and set a time to come to her. Now, I love this. I love all my sources, but I love this source. I love this source because here you have a man who's very religious and he's very scrupulous with his tzitzit and he has a taiva. He has an appetite for high-end prostitutes who like are really good at what they do. And he's willing to pay 400 coins. Again, this speaks to this tension. Sex is all about pleasure, bodily pleasure. And it can distract people in this direction, despite his wearing his tzitzit and being scrupulous and pray, you know, all the things he's doing. She said, when his time came, he went. She said, let him come in. When he entered, she had prepared for him seven beds, six of silver and one of gold, right? Ladders going up with six, six silver ladders and gold at the top. You don't need a lot of imagination to understand, right? Seven is an important number, seven days of creation. The pinnacle of creation is day seven, which is the Shabbat where you get to rest. But um, here the metaphor is he's going up the six beds to get to the gold bed at the top where orgasmic pleasure and delight await him on levels one can't even fantasize about, right? He's going up the ladders to get to number seven. Rabbis have a great imagination. This story is an amazingly written story. And so what happens? She's on the seventh bed naked, right? So if you needed any more visual, whoa, like I can't, I can't even imagine, right? What that experience is like. And he's climbing up and as he's climbing up the ladders, and you can imagine the tension building, the desire, the four strings of his tzitzit -tzi smack him in his face. You can think of a magic carpet if you want. Think of Aladdin with the fringes right on each end. You can think that he didn't take off his tzitzit -tzi, so because he's scrupulous. So he's running up the ladders and they kind of lift up from the gravity and smack him in the face. He falls down, down, on so many levels, right? So down, down, down. What was up now comes down. And she comes down. And I find that they got this right also in terms of gender. By the city of Rome, I will not let you rest until you tell me what blemish you saw in me. And you're like, sweetheart, you got 400 coins. You got paid in advance. What do you care? And all she can say is, what's wrong with me? Don't you like, aren't I pretty enough? Wait, what blemish do you see? Right? Like, I find that so insightful that women will always go to like, what's wrong? Aren't I pretty enough? Like, what's you, you got the money. Anyway, he says, I have never seen a more beautiful woman than you. Few, right? It's not you, it's me. But there is one commandment that God commanded us, and tzitzit is its name. Now the tzitzit are witnesses against me. She said to him, I will not let you rest until you tell me what your name is, the name of your town, the name of your teacher, the name of the school in which you learned this Torah. And so she basically asks him for his identity. And he so badly wants to get out of there that he gives it to her. If you're thinking Judah and Tamar, for those who know that biblical story, definite allusions to that, right? Where he hands over everything about him and runs out of there. Okay. She got up, divided her possessions, one third for the government, one third for the poor. This is a righteous woman. She might be a prostitute, but she pays her taxes before leaving town. She gives a third to the poor and the third she keeps, including the sheets from her bed. And she goes to the baby drash to Rabbi Chia and she says, Rabbi, make me a convert. And he says to her, my daughter, have you set your eyes on one of the students? She took out the paper and gave it to him which she tells him the story. He says, go and enjoy your purchase. Normally, by the way, it's men who acquire women in marriage. He's so impressed with her that he treats her like a man. Go and enjoy your purchase, right? Go marry him. Then the sheets which she had spread for him in prohibition, she now spread for him lawfully. And really get a beautiful idea that she's a high-end prostitute and she can bring all the tricks of her trade into her marital bed. She doesn't have to pretend she's not who she was. And now he, for, you know, we could say he lucked out, right? He now has this wife who is going to now use everything she knew from her years in the profession on him, right? So there's something very empowering about female sexuality. She takes control of this story. She, you know, upends her life, right? It's 
that that story of the Yetzar Hara that motivates, right? She, in a, in a flip way, is so impressed by a man who can show restraint at this last moment because of his religion, because of his Torah, that she says, I want that. And so she comes and she changes her life and she converts and uh, and she remains a woman who is filled with um, uh, the ability to give and I would like to think receive sexual pleasure. Okay, I have now uh, really, I uh, don't have a lot of time left and I'm gonna scroll down, but what we've seen so far, number one, the tension, number two, the awareness that this can be a profoundly exper uh, 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 meaningful and even sanctified uh, experience if it's done with thoughtfulness, intent, and I have consensuality. We're going to get to consensuality. I hope I, I must get there. What I'm skipping now is the right to women in uh, to have sexual relations. We've been talking a lot about the male, um, the male lens, right? That men, that the understanding men need sexual outlets, men seek it, men are motivated to get married in order to express it. The rabbis were aware that there was a power dynamic and an imbalance in the in the male female sexual relationship, as there are often in many sexual relationships, also male male female female. Right, sexuality creates can create power dynamics, and in order to uh, redress that, uh, they interpret a biblical text um, that gives women the right to sexual relations in marriage. A man has a duty and the woman has a right. Now, I don't have time to flesh this out completely. It's very interesting. It means that a woman cannot be forced to have sexual relations. It's not her duty. It's his duty to provide. But in all fairness, she can't consistently refuse or it's grounds for divorce, okay? She can't be forced. It's not like in American law. Until the 1990s, in some states, a man could not rape his wife because it was her duty to provide him with sex. It took a long time until the laws were willing, both in England and in America, I can't speak of the rest of the world, until they were willing to recognize marital rape because so deeply ingrained is this sense of duty of the wife to provide for her husband, right, for his needs. The rabbinic world upended that by already balancing this dynamic and saying a woman has a right to sex. A woman is a sexual creature. A woman has a right to sex. A man has to provide her with sex, right? Just even the language change is significant. And if she's not being provided with sex and you're gonna, well, maybe women didn't want sex. In the middle ages, we have lots of responsa where women come to the rabbinic court and say, our husbands are not having sex with us, right? They're not providing us with our right, right? We know that women also have sexual desire, sexual need, not just to have children, that's part of it. So notice what Maimonides says. If she rebels, a rebellious wife is one who refuses to have sex. As I said, a rebellious husband is a husband who refuses to have sex, right? We use the same language. If she says he is loathsome to me and I cannot willingly have relations with him, then pressure is exerted on him to divorce her because she is not like a captive, that she has to have relations with a man who is hateful to her. That is a very important sentence, right? The awareness, that consent, that desire, right? That willingness are a very essential part of the marital relationship. And as I said, I would extrapolate that to a value, right? In any sexual relationship, same sex, hetero, pre-marriage, post-marriage, whatever it is, the idea that forcing someone to have sex goes against the very grain of what Judaism holds dear in the sexual relationship. And now I'm going to bring Rav Soloveitchik before I begin wrapping up. Judaism did not overlook or underestimate the physical aspects of marriage. On the contrary, one sacrificial withdrawal from the sinful erotic paradise of change and variety is completed. The natural element in marriage comes to the fore. The two partners owe each other not only fidelity, notice again, fidelity is a value, which I would say again, we can extrapolate into what is Judaism, what, what is Judaism's direction if I'm not married or I'm not straight, right? Like fidelity is a big piece of, of Jewish values, of a Jewish sexual ethic. 
but also full gratification of their sexual needs, right? This sensitivity to that, the vulnerability. When I have sexual needs and I need to come to you, I'm vulnerable in asking you to fulfill my needs and vice versa. Refusal or failure by one of the partners to satisfy the conjugal rights of the other is sufficient reason for divorce. Each one must observe these laws of consortium with regard to the other. The marriage must not be converted into an exclusively spiritual fellowship. Marriage without carnal enjoyment and erotic love is contrary to human nature, is to be dissolved. So again, very, um, I think a very beautifully articulated um, uh, expression of how central um, sexuality is in the uh, erotic love is in a committed relationship. I will pause and say, I've had asexual people say to me, wait a minute, but where does that leave us? Not enough time to address everything fully. I will say that um, obviously if two asexual people marry and neither of them wanna have sex, they want a romantic fellowship, a spiritual fellowship, then that is considered a marriage and by Jewish standards, also a marriage. It becomes tricky when one person is asexual and one person is not. And that would be a very hard uh, space to, to maintain both religiously and not. But, um, but I've had that question. So I'm just putting, again, what's new about uh, some of the challenges coming up today are people who want to have romantic companionship, romantic fidelity, commitment, emotional uh, um, you know, fidelity, but um, but they don't want the sexual piece. And that's very new. And I don't think Rob Soloveitchik could have considered a situation like that. Okay, I'm now gonna quickly skim through um, through my sources, but, um, but as I said, consensuality, um, not having sex when someone is too drunk, right? That is a Jewish ethic, absolutely. Not having someone, sex with someone you despise, not, fantasizing actively about another person. I'm not talking about sometimes role-playing or uh, a, a mild fantasy, but like I'm in love with someone else but I'm having sex with you because you're here and you're available, right? These are things that appear in one of the tractates uh, of the Talmud that these are that these are not just unhealthy. These are um, these are these are really prohibited ways to have sex. That the sexual relationship needs to be an ethical relationship, right? Um, okay, we're going to skip down as I, um, one thing I'm not getting to is the whole topic of, of Nita and Mikvah. It's an area in which I have tremendous expertise, the idea of creating a framework for sexual and non-sexual space is definitely something that I see both Orthodox and non-Orthodox and gay couples considering very interesting because I think for many years, going to the mikvah in the aftermath of menstruation was considered very menstrual taboos, misogyny, patriarchy. And you're seeing some resurgence, even outside of orthodoxy, in wanting to cl claim a ritual that can be that can create something empowering and something that has intentionality, right? When I, when I teach lesbian women who say, we're getting married, we want to use mikvah, they talk about wanting to bring sanctity into their marriage, intentionality into their marriage. The idea that there is time where there's no sex and time that there is sex creates a very interesting framework of um, thinking about our different needs and expectations in the sexual relationship. So again, I'm gonna put that on the side, definitely worthy of, of a talk and you have, uh, you have the sources. Um, I think where I'll end is, and I want to leave some time for, um, for questions, is I've talked uh, to this point, the tension we have with sexuality, the ultimate acceptance and awareness that sex can have a very meaningful role in our lives, in our religious lives, in our spiritual lives, in our personal lives, and that we need to have a framework, direction, and ethical guidelines, which I'll call Jewish values, right? The idea of not doing harm to someone else. The idea of seeing the dignity in the other person, I'm having a sexual relationship. And that really crosses over from the heterosexual marital framework to all frameworks in which people are engaging in sex. Sometimes people say to me, well, what about casual sex? What about just like, I like hookups. I like one night, I'm, I'm into junk sex, right? I'm gonna use my student's phrase. I'm into, I'll I, I don't judge anyone. Um, and I certainly, I'm open enough that people come and ask these things. The only thing I will say is, again, you have to make sure there's not too much drinking 
and real consensuality, right? Like that, that's essential for anyone, um, under, you know, embarking on any sort of sexual interaction and consensuality today, consent is really the big conversation in, um, in sexual education, sexual counseling, because no means no did not cut it. And so then the question is, how do we create a better framework for evaluating consent, what consent means, and I really and, and intent, right? And so I would say if there's one takeaway that I want, particularly, you know, my, my the, the college students I teach and the grant, you know, the, the, the young professionals is um being really, really thoughtful about what consent means and what it means when, come on, you know, it's not so bad. I really want it, I really need it, I bought you dinner, right? Like that kind that's <laughs> Let, let's do away with that kind of those subtle pressures in marriage as well, right? In, in a marital or a committed framework as well. Um, I, I just want to end with, with something Benny Lau, Rabbi Benny Lau um, wrote. He already wrote it many years ago, but I think it's a very important um, ending that uh, Rabbi Benny Lau is being asked what to do about um, LGBTQ members of our community. And I think, right, it, it took a long time until the reform and conservative movements actively began to accept um, gay members, trans members in their community. It's funny, we forget that. I, I definitely can go through the historical process that led to it. Now orthodoxy is the most resistant, even though things are opening up there a little bit slowly as well. But what Benny Lau says at the end, and I think this is where um, I want to want to end and bring us back to the beginning of Bray Sheet, God says it is not good for humans to be alone, right? People need companionship. People need relationship, whether it's in a sexual sense, an emotional sense, a spiritual sense, whether it's in our synagogues, whether it's in a community like this one where we gather uh, to learn together, right? People need one another in order to uh, feel connected, engaged, and, uh, and that their lives have uh, an anchor. But now I'm shifting to the sexual sense. That um, that what Rav, Rav Lau says is, um, we really need to help people exit from darkness to life. I'm in mean, the last light, last line, and from death to life. Loneliness is deadly poison, and faithful relationship is the elixir of life. Choose life, and so this idea that relationship particularly intimacy, right? Sexuality has the potential to bring light, to bring life, literally when we have children, of course, but um, life in the sense of feeling alive of feeling this deep connection, we need to be more thoughtful about how we, um, we talk about this in, uh, in, from the Jewish perspective and certainly how we counsel people who are in different spaces than they were a hundred years ago, a thousand years ago, right? We can take the values, we can take the ideas and we can use them uh, in order to create, I think, a strong Jewish sexual ethic that can guide people when they make uh, the decisions they make, whether it's, whether it's within the sanctified or sanctioned framework or not. So I'm gonna pause here, thank you. And uh, I'm going to let people who want to um, ask questions, please, I would welcome that. Hey, so thank you very, very much for um, this amazing talk. And I think, and I was seeing some comments also in the chat, definitely also a teaser to, to learn more and open up uh, more around this. And there, I'm going to ask uh, some of the questions that already come came up and comments, and then we'll see uh, if uh, more things come up. One of them uh, was about, uh, is there any relating to polyamory or ethical non-monogamy, considering also that biblical was not monogamous and you brought in the Talmudic rabbinic text. So if you can- I am about. so glad you asked that. I'm going to both give an answer and deflect. Um, polyamory has become, I will say, Judaism went in the Judeo-Christian model of one-on-one, -on -one, of monogamy as one, one man, one woman. Right? Again, we, we've talked now, things have changed, LGBT. You, whoever asked the question is correct that men could have multiple partners, right? They could have concubines and they could have handmaidens and they could have wives, they more than one wife, right? Men were, were allowed in the ancient world to be, it's funny to call it polyamorous because things then weren't really about love, but um, but they were allowed to have multiple sexual relationships. Women were much more restricted, right, for, for lots of reasons and, and another time. Um, but I, I want to say that it has become a hot topic, meaning Bar Ilan University, which is a religious university, right, it's a Jewish religious university, had a conference probably about three or four years ago on polyamory, 
And it, it like erupted with people protesting outside, like how can a religious university host a conference for sex therapists on polyamory, given that it's, you know, it goes against the grain, this, the, 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 the religious model and the halachic model and so on. And so, I, I, you know, the New Yorker just had an article about polyamory. It is definitely something new that I am not yet ready to really address. I have not yet had anyone come to me with that question. But I know that people are talking about it and it's only a matter of time. I, I think we're gonna have to like really rethink um, what, what that means and what that means in a Jewish context. So thank you for the question. I can't say more than that at this point. If, if I can push a little more and then you can deflect more, but in the Talmud, is there not like uh, kind of, are there texts relating to this? Is it something that like, uh, the Talmud really begins to preference one man, one woman. They, like, even though in Babylonia, you could take a second wife, it was really only if your first wife was childless. I, I'm not saying that they didn't understand prostitutes, but that's not what we're talking about here. We're not talking about that. No, polyamory does not does not exist, right? It's not, we'd have to like, we, we could go back to the biblical model, but really that's about marriage. It's a different, it's a different model. It's a different model. It's something new. I think we're going to be hearing more about it in the coming years, um, but thank you for asking. Thank you. Uh, another interesting question is um, about uh, having the the sources and imagery and thoughts uh, on sexual relationships coming from the Ashkenazi world. I'll paraphrase and say Western world. And is there any difference uh, looking at Jewish Mizrahi world? Is there anything to think that there's a difference between these two? Yeah, so, so not really. Meaning, in other words, if anything, I would say um, on one hand, you could say Christianity is a much more, you know, perhaps much more um, restrictive or prudish uh, religion than, than Islam. On the other hand, Maimonides, who then becomes the Shulchan Arach, they're, they're pretty restrictive. They're actually more restrictive. Well, the Shulchan Arach, Rabbi Joseph Karo, was in many ways more restrictive than both Maimonides and then his uh, Ashkenazi counterpart. I'll say, just as an interesting anecdote, um, Male, you know, the idea of an older man and a younger boy, which is very hard for me to even know, was more tolerated in Islamic countries. And so you're going to find more, it's going to exist more in Jewish communities than Islamic countries. I know that's not what you wanted to hear, but that's going to be, that's something that comes to mind where in Christianity, that's totally taboo. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but it's certainly not accepted. Um, men can have more than one wife in Sephardi countries, in the Eastern countries, in Yemen, in Morocco, for, for far longer than in the, the Ashkenazi countries. It's just not happening. So I, I don't think there's anything different in terms of attitudes towards sexuality. Um, the expectation is really heterosexual marriage, except that um, that men have more, there's a little more forgiveness for men having maybe a concubine, for instance, in Mizrahi, in the, in the East, and not in the West. So uh, we have a couple more minutes and I do want to ask, especially because it's the first time we have you uh, here with us. Like, can I ask a little about your own journey uh, into this uh, world uh, and how you found yourself in this expertise? Yeah, sure. So I'll just comment. Someone said priests and young boys. I, I didn't say it didn't exist in Christianity. I just said in Islam, in, in Islamic countries, it was tolerated in a way that it was hit right in in Christian countries, it's going to be very under the radar taboo. We know it. We're, we're certainly not going to be talking about it. In Muslim countries, it's it's more accepted. It just is. It's a more accepted model. Um, I'm not saying the 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 right. There was poetry written about it, right? So that's all I was saying there. Not that it doesn't exist everywhere, but okay. Um, and I'll just say, uh, wow, you have to bring me back to answer some of these other questions. Um, uh, as far as my own journey, I would say. It's, a, it's an interesting question. Um, it, it started with, as a woman, um, beginning to learn Talmud and being drawn to texts about women. And really that brought me to the tractates that were about marriage and divorce, but also about menstruation and about sexuality and really trying to find myself in the text. And at a certain point, I realized I wanted to continue learning more I wanted to learn more about menstruation and Jewish law and menstruation and, and ritual immersion. And, um, and that 
I also began to be asked to teach women before they were married brides. And that led to me teaching couples before they were married. And I teach at a place called Pardes. It's a non-denominational space. We have a, 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 a gay LGBTQ student body, uh, students who feel safe coming and learning Torah, which they can't always do in other places. And, um, and I began to teach them and they began to teach me, right? So, um, so I think really there was almost an organic unfolding in the last 30 years of the text that I was most drawn to in the biblical um, text, but mostly in the rabbinic text that were on these topics. And, and that led to my interest in furthering that. Uh, my, my master's degree um, was on the beautiful captive woman, right? That idea of a man taking a woman in, in war and rabbinic interpretation. And, um, and so I'm always being drawn to those topics and drawn back into those topics. And that led to teaching and counseling and so on. Lovely. Thank you so much. Maybe if I can just go overboard for two minutes over time, yeah. I hope everyone forgives me and ask another question. Because in, uh, in Israel, at least, there's this huge gap distance rift between the secular and religious societies and the way they view these texts. And I think specifically about and around sexuality in many ways. So can you say something about like, do you find yourself crossing over into the secular world? Does that happen with Israelis? So yeah, see? first of all, I think there is work being done. There are some really great, you know, cross deny secular religious learning going on. Not enough, not spreading fast enough, but that but that is happening. And there's a rabbinic organization called Sohar, which really went out to make the whole premarital process. Um, uh, an inspir inspiring one to the secular population, which no one had done about 20 years ago, right? Until then, they had to go to the, the traditional Rebitson, uh, you know, I, I'm going to be stereotypical, and her frumpy wig, who's telling them that they have to count these days after their period and go immerse. And sec everyone has to go to the Rebitson to get a letter, right? And so it was a terrible process. And they really came in and revolutionized it and made it much more user-friendly and empowering for the secular couples. So that was a big thing because that was like a bridging over. Let's use all of our know-how and expertise and let's be honest and real about this population and make it a positive experience. So that's been happening. Um, I would say I speak a lot in non-Orthodox spaces, but I'm more in the English speaking world, both in Israel and, and abroad. Um, there is some of that happening. I don't want to say right, that there is some of that happening, um, but but not enough. Not enough. I think I've I've sometimes had secular people come up and say we need more of what you're talking about in our schools. There's literally nothing, right? You, you teach them, you know, like there's no sex education, no sex ethics, nothing. We there's work to do. Okay. Rabbanit uh, Nechama, thank you so much for this fascinating talk. Uh, I think you'll see in the comments that many people enjoyed this and want you back. So hopefully okay, we'll wonderful. do uh, that. Okay. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us and have a wonderful rest of your day. And tell people, people ask me questions, but please have them email me. Um, I'll be happy to, uh, to, to, to answer. Uh, I see some people emailed me, uh, asked some pr personal questions. They can ask so, me. Perfect. So thank you for mentioning that. I will include uh, your email in our follow-up uh, email with the recording. Um, mm -hmm. So you'll receive Lanit uh, Nechama's email and can also uh, write to her personally. Thank okay. you, everyone. Have a lovely day, afternoon, evening, wherever you are. Bye. Bye.